Hello, I'm Mariana Hartley, uh, archaeologist with Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation, and I'm going to talk uh, today a little about the excavations that we conducted from 2016 to 2019 inside the 1906 Memorial Church and Historic Church Tower. And we were going to investigate some of the multiple churches that have been on the site. This map shows discoveries that were made by Rediscovery Foundation over the last 27 years. And the first church that was built on the site was built in 1608. And it was used until 1616 when it was in such a ruinous state that they were meeting in the storehouse. Uh, in 1617, uh, Governor Argyll orders the construction of a new church, uh, which he moves to the new central location of the five side expanded James Ford. Subsequent brick churches were built on that same location. Now, the 1617 wooden church uh, was said that it was built of timber and was 50 feet long by 20 feet wide, but there wasn't much else for us to go by in terms of historical documents. Um, in 1619, the first General Assembly meeting takes place in the chancel and choir of that church, and so our excavations were focused on pinpointing where that meeting took place. In 1639, Governor John Harvey writes that the citizens raised money for a new brick church uh, to replace the earlier wooden church, and they are still raising money for this church as late as 1647, so we think that the church is probably complete sometime right after that. That church is burned in 1676 during Bacon's Rebellion when Nathaniel Bacon leads a group of rebels against the then governor, Governor William Barclay. The church burns and is rebuilt um, in the 1680s and used until sometime in the middle of the 18th century when it is deconsecrated and abandoned. By 1800, the Ambler and Lee families used the bricks from that ruined church to build a churchyard a wall that encloses a portion of the cemetery and the eastern end of the brick church. Um, by the 19th century, most of the images of Jamestown show the lone church tower as the only standing relic from the colonial period. In the 1890s, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, the Pres Preservation of Virginia Today, um, take over 22 and a half acres on the western end of Jamestown Island, including the church tower, and start doing preservation work. One of the first things that they do is excavate the area adjacent to the church tower in order to expose the brick church ruins. Uh, Mary Jeffrey Galt writes that in 1897, she dug with her own hands inside the south wall of the brick church and actually uncovered a cobblestone and clay foundation capped with a narrow course of brick that she believed was for the 1617 church. The uh, women who dug the church, including Annie Galt and Mary Winter Garrett, were joined by engineers working on the seawall at the time, John Tyler Jr. and Samuel Argyll. Together, these previous excavators left us images, maps, and a lot of reports on what their excavations recovered. And these were invaluable as we started our research and excavations. This is the Memorial Church where our excavations took place and pretty much how the site stands today with the ruined tower. This is the site as it looked in 1901, looking down from the church tower. Um, and here are some of the things that they found. Uh, so like I said, they uncovered the north, south, east, and west foundations for the brick church and cobblestone and clay foundation sections on the north and south. In the eastern end of the church at the upper end of the screen, they found three levels of floor pavers and multiple burials. They also found two tombstones, um, one for a minister who died in the late 17th century and a tombstone that once held memorial brasses, which had been robbed, that was turned north south to be used as a paver um, for the entrance to the brick church. Interestingly, it also had the figurine of a knight uh, and carved into it. And so it became known as the knight's tomb. In 2016, this is how the Memorial Church looked when we started our excavations. You could peek down into the glass along the north and south walls to see both the earlier church and the later brick church foundations. And then in 2017, this is how it looked after we removed some of the backfill from the APBA excavations 
and also the Memorial Church floor. And uh, one cool thing is that we found an 1897 dime in the backfill of Mary Jeffrey Velt's trench where she found the 1617 church foundation. So kind of her calling card for us. Now, I mentioned that they um, uncovered uh, these sections of cobblestone and clay capped with bricks. So the first thing we did was go back and take the backfill out of their trenches and take a closer examination at these foundations. And what we found is that they constructed this wall by digging these trenches that were approximately eight inches to a foot deep and about a foot wide, packing in uh, mortar-like yellow clay and cobblestones. Some of these cobbles were andesite and Bermuda limestone, likely ballast that was brought here to Jamestown aboard the ships. Now the footing of clay and, and cobblestones was capped with two courses of brick and a very refined mortar. However, there were other interesting details we noticed in the profile. One of them is that there were undug uh, areas left between sections of clay foundation, um, kind of intermittently dispersed between north and south foundations. And we're not sure what these were used for, but the brick courses continued over top of the topsoil. So it wasn't a full gap to allow airflow for underneath the floor, for example. So this is a mystery that we're still trying to solve as to why they were doing this. Now, I said that we were looking for more of these foundations, uh, hoping to find the end walls because the excavators back in the early 20th century did not identify the east nor the west ends of the building. And we needed those in order to delineate exactly where the General Assembly met. So we looked in the eastern end and despite the fact that there were numerous graves that um, were cutting through the eastern end of the church related to the brick church, the later brick church, we did find that the graves missed all of the, uh, the footings. So we had uh, three different sections where cobblestones or just a piece of clay survived to give us the north-south oriented wall that was the original east wall of the 1617 church. Now projecting out from there to the west, um, we found that going 50 feet we ended up projecting right in the center of the historic Jamestown Church Tower. And we feared that uh, past excavators maybe had dug inside the tower and had blown out any evidence of the foundation. Uh, but we decided uh, towards the end of our excavations, the beginning of 2019, to take a look and see if we could find any evidence of a west wall. And we started with a uh, GPR survey uh, doing half foot intervals. And lo and behold, we did find a feature um, on our, our data that showed up in the center of the tower about where a Western foundation should show up. And it was uh, about a foot wide and oriented north south. And when we peeled back the eight inches of brick and concrete in the floor of the tower, uh, we found that yes, the, uh, there was a section of cobblestone footing capped with one course of brick, uh, about eight feet wide, truncated on the north and south by the tower, but it was the end of the wall. So very exciting because uh, that allowed us to have the complete outline uh, in which to um, parcel out where the choir and chancel where the General Assembly met uh, actually was in that church in the eastern end. Now, the next thing we looked at were the um, fabrics that we had found related to that 1617 church. And our team started uh, to pull out uh, brick church versus earlier church uh, pieces and fabrics. And what we found were um, two types, an exterior plaster that had a clay backing to it, which when we removed the clay, some pieces had these uh, thumb-like protrusions off the back of them where we think uh, the clay wall was dimpled uh, so that you could kind of key in the plaster, provide more surface area and improve the hold of the plaster on the exterior of the building. Uh, the other uh, type of plaster that we were seeing had a uh, brown coat or a kind of uh, lime putty mortar attached to it and had impressions of wood, wooden lath. And that led us to finally discover what the fabrics of the building were and how it was constructed. And what we found is that uh, the 1617 church um, was a close studded uh, timber frame structure. And this is our most recent conceptualized image. So it's not a collaborative structure like 
Um, some conceptualized images from the past have shown. And uh, this is a, a model that was done by our 3D modeler, uh, Cindy Duell, recently. So anyway, we are very excited to have a new image of what uh, that building looked like. Now, another thing that we had been focused on was once we found that church, we wondered if we could identify any burials that um, were for individuals who participated in the General Assembly or who uh, died during the period in which this church was in use. And we did find in the chancel, area very center, a extra wide burials over three feet wide um, in, this, in the very center. And there were no burials to the north or south. So a very prominent placement there in the chancel. And that got us to thinking whether or not it could belong to um, Sir George Yardley, who was, um, when he died, he was uh, serving his third term as governor, but his claim to fame at Jamestown in part was because he uh, led the General Assembly in its first meeting. Now, the tombstone that the women found in 1901 uh, with the uh, night form on it had traditionally been thought to belong to Yardley, and we found that the uh, grave would easily have accommodated that stone. Uh, also, there were no artifacts from the deconstruction of the 1617 church located in it, whereas every other burial that we found in the church had some of that deconstruction rubble. So very, very exciting. And uh, we excavated that grave in July of 2018 and are presently still waiting on, um, on uh, any results from our DNA testing. We're yet to find a relative who we can tie to Yardley in the very specific way with the mitochondrial or bichromosomal DNA uh, to test against. So we're still, still hopeful, but we're waiting on those results. Now, um, the past excavators uh, saw that the brick church was built up around the foundations for the timber frame, and therefore they wondered if the timber frame structure could have been still standing when the brick church was constructed. And um, we were thinking that as well, because um, it's very, very good chance that at least part of that timber frame structure was standing uh, during that period of time. And what we found though, led us to uh, understand that it was far more complex than we believed, that during the transition from timber frame to brick church, um, some components of the earlier church were likely kept or incorporated into the new building. So one of the things that we saw first was that the 1639 church uh, south foundation was actually built right up abutting um, next to the south foundation for the 1617 church. Um, and there's no reason you would do this. Why not just take apart the cobblestone foundation and move it out of the way so that you can properly build your new structure unless that building was standing. So that's part of the evidence that led us to believe, okay, that they're enclosing the present standing church. Um, however, we know that at some point, the east end of the church does come down. The um, end that we excavated had uh, multiple layers of tiles and a couple of sections that weren't dug by the previous excavators. Um, some had evidence of Bacon's Rebellion. Some were earlier floors located in the church from where they took down the east wall. Plus most of the plasters that we found were located in that eastern end. As we moved back to the western end, we got an even more interesting story. Um, up along the southern wall in the southwestern corner, we found a junction where it looked like um, the east wall came to a stopping point, and then at a later point, the west wall was added. And at this juncture, we started to look closely at the mortars and found that there were two different types. Across from us uh, on the northern wall, the same junction existed at approximately the same distance from the northwest corner. And uh, right now we're working with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, you can see the east um, gray mortar on the left-hand side. And then to the west, there's a more brown colored mortar. And what we're finding is that during the time that they're building the western portion of the church, they've added more clay uh, to the mortar. Um, so very, very interesting story there and we're still studying it. But right now we think the Eastern end was probably constructed around 1639 and may have been built up to the roof. And then a portion of the timber frame structure was left 
at the opposite end of the building to the west. We don't know yet why. Uh, we're, we're very fascinated as to, to why they would have left part of the structure standing. Perhaps they're still using the framing for the roof. Um, and uh, the, maybe the brick church held none of that uh, weight. But um, this is kind of a, um, a fun take on what may be going on in terms of the initial look uh, while they're transitioning from that timber frame structure uh, to a full brick structure later on with a church tower in the 1680s. Um, so maybe the only reason that they left it is because uh, the original timber frame has a belfry at that end. Um, my colleague um, Anna Shackford will discuss more of what we're finding on the outside of the church uh, to kind of give us some more clues as to uh, how this um, metamorphosis happens from a timber frame structure to a brick church. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. We have a lot more researching to do on the churches. And um, I appreciate you all watching and look forward to any questions you have. Thank you.